have your Bible, turn to Joshua. You know where Joshua is? Go to Genesis. How many books over? Anyone? How many books over from Joshua is Genesis is Joshua? Just to help, you don't want to assume everyone knows. Um, before we read, before we start, let me pray. Let me pray. Heavenly Father, we pray that you would help us to read, help us to understand. I pray that you would make it clear, Lord, that you rule and you reign supreme. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So, I'm going to ask you a question. Um, who said this? There are no more worlds to conquer. Isn't that in, uh, nope. Yes, sir. Alexander the Great. Spot on. Alexander the Great. He was a leader, a boy king, a conqueror who would go from empire to empire, building up his dynasty. Um, and he was remembered. He was a king. Yes, of a place called Macedon. We know it as Macedonia. Uh, he was born in 356 BC. He succeeded his dad, Philip, at the age of 20. So imagine being king at the age of 20. Uh, he spent most of his ruling years on a military campaign as a commander, and he would go from country, country to country, basically taking down kingdoms. He would go throughout Asia. Man, I wish we had a map. He would go throughout Asia, all the way throughout the Northeast Africa until the age of 30. So for 10 years, that's what he was doing. Conquering nation after nation. Forming, forming them to be part of his empire. Stretching from Greece to Egypt into present day Pakistan. He was undefeated in battle and is considered one of history's most successful commanders. Alexander the Great, right? Yet, he is only to be remembered in history books. We don't have a statue of him right now. He doesn't have an army that follows him right now. The Alexandrian kingdom is no longer a force. It is a piece of history. This is what Alexander said on his deathbed. When my casket is being carried to the grave, leave my hands hanging outside. For empty-handed I came into this world, empty-handed I shall go. Very biblical. But he didn't believe in God. My whole life, he says, has been a hollow waste of futile exercise. Does that sound like a good king? He conquered, got it all, but he says it was a waste. For no one at death can take anything with them. He is a dead conqueror. Now, we go to Joshua chapter 6. A very long chapter, but for the sake of time, I'm going to take it in bite sizes for us to work through. But our passage shows that the Lord, God, He is the greatest conqueror of them all. Uh, he led Israel to victory over Jericho and gave Canaan to Israel. Like a gift. And this is, if you're going to take anything out of this message, it's this. The plan and execution for victory over Jericho required one thing. Faith in God and obedience. One thing. So I'm going to be working my way through this. Um, there's three headings I'm going to have us work through. Basically like a scene through different stories. The first one is God rules. The second one is God commands. And then the third one is God says. Yes, pull those in. <clears throat> 
Let's start with the first point, God rules. Unlike the kings of the world of this world today, even past, kings in this world are susceptible to temptations and challenges. They will fall, they will fail. Kings in this world are are going to be susceptible to stronger kings, bigger nations. If a stronger nation comes with a bigger army and they unify, they will take down the smaller army. Well, we see in Joshua chapter 6, and I want you to turn there, verse 2. This is what the Lord says to Joshua. I have given Jericho into your hand with its king and mighty men of valor. All right? Alexander the Great could never do that. He could never do that. He could never actually tell his commander, listen, back behind those walls, I have given them into your hands. He couldn't do that. That's what God is doing with Joshua. This is unlike any other king ever. God of Israel, the creator of all things, is at the center of every single event in history. Every single event in your life. He rules and reigns in the most unorthodox way. He knows all things before they occur. And every ruling he makes is just. Because you're going to see this. And even if you know the story off by heart, it's not as if when I speak to you about the fall of Jericho, that it's the walls came down, the Israelites walked in, and then they sat down and they conquered nice and neatly like a pack of cards. No. Everything was devoted to destruction. It was a violent takeover. But God gave them into Israel's hands. Now, just to, just to paint you, give you a picture of how Genesis fits in, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, fits into this. In the great redemptive plan of God, Jericho was a kingdom that was basically in God's way. It was simply in God's way. It was a destructive pattern for God's people. They, they were a sinful people. They were a cursed people. They defied God in every single way. If you go to books like Leviticus, specifically the people of Jericho are known for being sinful and evil. The judgment hand of God was on them. And God is the God of authority. He rules and reigns he is the one true God. He is a jealous God. And this is God's jealousy in action here in Joshua chapter 6. So let's go to the second one, God commands. So this is, this is what happens. Now, I'm going to read this next bit. So I want you to follow along um, from verse 3. You shall march. This is what the Lord says to Joshua. You shall march around the city, all the men of war going around the city once, thus shall, you go, thus shall you do for six days. Seven priests shall bear seven trumpets of ram's horns before the ark. On the seventh day you shall march around the city seven times, and the priests shall bow the trumpets. And when they make a long blast with the ram's horn, when you hear the sound of the trumpet, then all the people shall shout with a great shout, and the wall of the city will fall, flat, uh, fall down flat. And the people shall go up, everyone straight before him. So Joshua the son of Nun called the priests and said to them, Take up the Ark of the Covenant and let seven priests bear seven trumpets of ram's horns before the Ark of the, of the Lord. And he said to the people, Go forward, march around the city, and let the armed men pass on before the Ark of the Lord. Verse 8, And just as Joshua had commanded the people, the seven priests bearing the seven trumpets of ram's horns before the Lord went forward, blowing the trumpets with the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord following them. And the armed men were walking before the priests who were blowing the trumpets, and the rear guard was walking after the Ark while the trumpets blew continually. I want you to follow along. This is very, very good. But Joshua commanded the people, You shall not shout or make your voice heard, neither shall any word go out of your mouth until the day I tell you to shout. Then you shall shout. So he caused the ark of the Lord to circle the city, going about it once. And then they came into the camp and spent the night in the camp. 
Then Joshua rose early in the morning, and the priests took up the ark of the Lord. And the seven priests, bearing the seven trumpets of ram horns before the ark of the Lord, walked on, and they blew the trumpets continually. And the armed men were, were walking before them. And the rear guard was walking after the ark of the Lord, while the trumpets blew continually. And the second day, they marched around the city once and returned into camp. And so, so they did for six days. On the seventh day, they rose early at the dawn of day and marched around the city in the same manner seven times. It was only on that day that they marched around the city seven times. And at the seventh time, when the priest had blown the trumpets, Joshua said to the people, Shout! For the Lord has given you the city. And the city and all that is within it shall be devoted to the Lord for destruction. Only Rahab the prostitute and all who were with her in her house shall live. Because she hid the messengers whom we sent. But you keep yourselves from the things devoted to destruction. Lest when you have devoted them... You take any of the devoted things and make the camp of Israel a thing for destruction and bring trouble upon it. But all silver and gold, every vessel of bronze and iron are holy to the Lord. They shall go into the treasury of the Lord. So the people shouted and the trumpets were blown. And as soon as people heard the sound of the trumpet, the people shouted a great shout and the wall fell down flat so that the people went up into the city. Every man straight before him and they captured the city. Then they devoted all in the city to destruction. Both men and women, young and old, oxen, sheep, and donkeys, with the edge of the sword. But to the two men who had spied out the land, Joshua said, Go to the prostitute's house and bring out from there the woman and all who belonged to her, as you swore to her. So the young men who had been spies went in, brought out Rahab, and her father and mother and brothers and all who belonged to her. And they brought all her relatives and put them outside the camp of Israel. And they burned the city with fire and everything in it. Only the silver and gold and the vessels of bronze and of iron they put into the treasury of the house of the Lord. But Rahab, the prostitute, and her father's household and all who belonged to her, Joshua saved alive. And she has lived in Israel to this day because she hid the messengers whom Joshua sent to spy out Jericho. Joshua laid an oath on them at that time, saying, Cursed before the Lord be the man who rises up and rebuilds the city of Jericho. At the cost of his firstborn shall he lay its foundation, and at the cost of his youngest son shall he set up its gates. So the Lord was with Joshua, and his fame was in all the land. I want you to take it in. A lot of information. I cannot pick up every stone, every leaf, every branch to explain everything, but this is what I'm going to do. <clears throat> God would have his people work, doing all according to his commands. What God has commanded, that we, his church, his people, we ought to do. So they were not to go about their business planting farms, building houses, going about as if nothing went wrong there. They weren't about to live a luxurious life as they were to cross over the the Jordan. No. God determined to send Jericho to destruction, yet his people are not to sit still. They are to labor. God commands his people through Joshua to go to Jericho marching. Doing exactly as he says, then the city will do what? He didn't say they'll knock on the walls. He said as soon as you surround the city, as soon as you march, what will happen? Verse 5, it will fall under itself. Their work is to consist, this is it, their work is to consist of daily marching, they are to go in convoy around the wall. The priests are to exercise their roles by carrying the Ark of the Covenant on their men's shoulders. The men of war are to be there to defend the Ark, to clear the way, to follow also in the rear, to guard it against the sudden attack. And they are to march 
the whole of six days. Not one day without its parade. Not one day without obedience to the great captain, the Lord. So let me ask you this. As they worked, as they obeyed, so must we. We must work. There shouldn't be a day in your life there is anything worthwhile in this life requires work. You need to work at it. So what is the work of a Christian? What are we to do? We say it every Sunday after the church service. What are we to do? Say that again? Yeah. Is that as simple as sending an email? Maybe. But some people go, right? And does that take the work of one person? No. It takes the work of a host of people. But we are to win the world for Jesus. He has commanded us. The Great Commission is our great ambition if you're a Christian. If you're sitting today here as a believer, whether you're a mom or a dad, or a brother or a sister, and you're a Christian, that is your work. To be educated, to learn in school every day, to be better at what it is you are good at. This should be your high ambition. But it must be through work. Or it can be through testimony. Last week, Pastor Kevin encouraged you to write your testimony. And I encourage you, if you have it, and you want to send it to someone that you know could, would love to hear it, do it. I might encourage them. So working could be through testimony. It could through, be through preaching of the gospel. It could through, be through prayer. It could be through encircling the city. Now, I'm not saying walking like Joshua with the people around the city, but am I being a little bit weird about that? No. People walk in the streets of Chattanooga praying, testifying, sharing the gospel. It is not unrealistic to walk the city. Continuously serving God is another piece of work. Walking in a life of obedience. Are you hard at work? That is your question to answer. Now let me ask the, the broader question for Concord. Does this church have a strong ethic for gospel work? I think they do. A lot of projects going on, a lot of vision, a lot of goals that they have in store for the future. We shall never see the church become strong and mighty till every single member of the church shall realize his or her responsibility. Each and every person has a responsibility in, in the work of the church. It is not just the job of those that get paid <clears throat> as pastors to do the work of gospel work. It is everyone's. We must all embrace the city. And I want you all to think about this. Think about this. Jesus fed the, 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 the 5,000, right? He did not take some of the five loaves. He didn't take some of the fish. He took all the loaves. And he took the bread and the fish, and though they were small, he took care to break all of it and to divide them among the people. Nothing of the boys' lunch was left over. All was used. And then by the multiplying power of God. That is the factor. There was not just sufficient for everyone that was there, but there were leftovers. And so we must give our all. We must bring out whatever it is, our bread. We must bring out the fishes, whatever talents we have. All must be devoted to God's cause. And in the use, ability will be multiplied. Some of you might be thinking now, I'm not very good at sharing the gospel. I'm not very good at sharing my testimony. I'm not very good at gospel work, period. Well, you need to work at that. And God will give you the ability in time. I mean, 
I can guarantee you many of the adults in the room, whether they had to describe the first time they gave a testimony or sharing of the gospel, I can promise you they would have said that it wasn't pretty. And they got better over time. And they read books which helped them grow. In the exercise of gospel work, grace will increase. But this is another thing. God does not... <clears throat> God does not give the same task to every single person. God tasks and equips different people for different tasks. There were different people doing different things when they were uh, marching around the city of Jericho. God has each of his children with their appointed tasks. You see, once Joshua gave the commands, it wasn't as if there were like 10 people running for the walls of Jericho. They all knew what they needed to do. There must be soldiers in the troops, priests in their array, and then again the men of war to bring up the rear. God would have his people work according to his own will. And so I want to encourage you, if you wondered what it is you ought to do, I encourage you to read scripture. I encourage you to work hard at school and to ask God in prayer to show you, to ask your parents what it is you're good at and work at. Each person has their specific opportunity to work. But thirdly, God saves. And this is a specific part, a part that's so encouraging. All who believe will be saved. At the end of this, God saves Rahab. <clears throat> he physically saves Rahab. Rahab <coughs> was a believer at this point. In Joshua chapter 6. He, uh, she was. But who was she? She was a, um, for the Israelites, she was a foreigner who was a prostitute and became one of God's people. She was not an Israelite, but she became one of God's people. This is something that you never saw. All right? When God would enter a city that was dead set against God and his ways, God would devote all of that to destruction, kill all of that off. But with Rahab, it's different. Grace was shown here. The story of Rahab in Joshua chapter 2 and 6 is an interesting exception to much of the conquest. Joshua, you will walk through it and you'll just see conquest upon conquest upon conquest. Very little people are saved. But this story in particular is very important. Rahab is first shown as a prostitute in the city of Jericho where she encounters two spies sent by Joshua to study the city to, for conquest. She successfully hides the two spies and when the, arm, when, when the armed forces come and they wonder where the spies are, she redirects them while she hides the spies. <clears throat> Before letting the spies go, in chapter 2, verses 9 and 13, she gives an interesting speech. And I encourage you to go there. Joshua chapter 2, verses 9 through 13. While you turn there, I'll read. And she said, this is, this is verse 9 of chapter 2, And she said to the men, I know that the Lord has given you the land, and that the fear of you has fallen upon us, and that all the inhabitants of the land melt away before you. For we have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea before you when you came out of Egypt, and what you did to the two kings of the Amorites who were beyond the Jordan, to Sion and Og, whom you devoted to destruction. And as soon, listen to this, as soon as we heard it, our hearts melted, and there was no spirit left in any man because of you. For the Lord your God, he is... God in the heavens above and on the earth beneath. Now then, please swear to me by the Lord that as I have dealt kindly with you, you also will deal kindly with my father's house and give me a sure sign that you will save alive my father and mother and brothers and sisters and all who belong to them and deliver our lives from death. So the spies left swearing an oath, telling her to bring every one into her house, hang a scarlet thread cord across the window as a sign, and they would be spared. 
Joshua chapter 6, verses 17. We, we continue with this, because then the story continues. Rahab and her family are spared. With verse 25, noting, But Joshua spared Rahab the prostitute with her family and all who belonged to her, because she hid the men Joshua had sent as spies to Jericho. And she lives among the Israelites to this day. But we don't just stop there. We go to another book in the Old Testament, Ruth. Ruth chapter 4, verses, you don't have to turn there. Ruth chapter 4, verses 18 through 22. It outlines the genealogy of King David. And it mentions a, a man by the name of Salmon, the father of Boaz. Everybody knows Boaz, right? You read Ruth. He was a kind, loving man. You know who his mom was? It was Rahab. It was Rahab. The marriage solidifies Rahab as an insider, one of the people of God. In the book of Joshua, we see how Rahab, this is a side note, but just for interest's sake, when you read through, go on into chapter 7, you're going to see like a crisscross, kind of a comparison between Rahab and Achan. Rahab is the ultimate outsider. Prostitute, Canaanite woman, Lady of the night, outsider. While Achan, an insider with pedigree, becomes the ultimate outsider, as he and his entire family are stoned for disobedience. The points, uh, this points out how Rahab shows God's loving kindness. Loving kindness to her. Even with the loving kindness God showed to Achan, Achan disregarded it. He rejected it. The oath that was given to Rahab became a formal relationship Rahab had with God in this confession we read in verse 11, where it said, Our hearts melted. He is the God in the heavens above and the earth beneath. And this is kind of a comparison when we go to the Gospels where the disciples are walking on the road to Emmaus and they met Jesus on that road. And it's beautiful. In Luke chapter 24, verse 32, it says, And they said to each other, Did not our hearts burn within us while he talked to us on the road, while he opened to us the scriptures? And Rahab, Rahab's heart opened up when she understood who God was while parting the Red Sea, while saving his people, she finally understood he is the one true God. And in him and in him alone is salvation. He is not just the great conqueror of nations, he is the great conqueror of hearts. He rules and reigns all. Coming back to Alexander the Great, seeking to reach the ends of the world, and I want you to, tonight to go to a map, okay? And I want you to see how his ends of the world are. Because it's, 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 it's quite funny when you look at a map. Because for him it was huge. And it was huge. All right? For 10 years he conquered a, quick, a, a big bit. Alexander invaded India in 326 BC. But he was eventually forced to turn back because his troops couldn't handle the fact that he wanted to take over everywhere. Alexander died in Babylon in 323 BC, where he planned to make that his capital. But in the years following his death, a series of civil war tore his empire apart. That empire, like I said before, no longer exists. But I want you to imagine a big map behind me. And I want you to imagine the great conquering king of Jesus. And how he is, in fact, conquering the world. Hearts. We often tend to think that God's conquering is a small, minute nation. Small host of people. Because those are all we can see right here, right now, tonight. But I want you to imagine that it is far bigger. When you look in the book of Revelation, you'll see people from every tribe, tongue, and nation worshipping the Lamb. That is what you should see. That is the God who conquers. Not like Alexander, who is dead and buried. 
Greatness should be measured by God. That is who is great. God rules and reigns. He does. And it doesn't matter what is on the news tonight. It doesn't matter what worries you have. It doesn't matter what difficulties you feel that is going on in your heart about the world to come next week, next month, next year, or the year to come with when it comes to the pandemic. I want you to understand one thing. God rules and reigns supreme. Supreme. So may all who hear and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ believe Believe and by faith turn toward God. You see, if you sit here tonight and you don't believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, I encourage you, like Rahab, like those disciples on the road to Emmaus, to believe. And if you don't, if you doubt, read. I encourage you to talk to a friend, to talk to your parents. But believe and be saved. Let me pray, and then we're going to be dismissed to a small group. Heavenly Father, we pray that you would help us.